Hi, I'm Paul Lancaster. Thanks for watching. The subject is trees, specifically Remarkable Trees of Virginia, the topic of a new book uh, by a couple of folks. Uh, Jeff Kerwin is a forestry professor here at Virginia Tech and extension specialist. Nancy Ross Hugo is an outdoor writer and co-author of the book. And Robert Llewellyn took the fabulous photographs. I want to give him certainly the credit that is due. And uh, Jeff, let me kind of start out on how uh, the whole idea of uh, keeping track of our trees got started. Well, I guess it's fair to start it with the American Forest, which is a conservation organization in Washington, D.C. Back in the 30s, they invited states to submit their largest trees that they could find in an effort to bring attention to them and hopefully preserve them. And Virginia joined in that effort in 1970 as a 4-H project, uh, a search to find the largest trees. And um, so, and this project was an outgrowth of that. Nancy approached me, what? four years ago right. now, and um, commented that the big trees sometimes leave out other trees. Sometimes the biggest tree of a species is kind of a freak of nature, and there are more beautiful, more significant trees out there that have historic and cultural significance, and um, maybe old trees. Well, Nancy, what drew you to the idea of doing a book about this? Um, well, I've been a tree person for a long time. They, I think they are the best, highest and best uh, representations of nature um, and I'd been very interested in the big tree program I think everybody is uh, because they're the superlative trees but as Jeff said it's really true that sometimes the champions are big but they might not be beautiful and they might not be the most um, uh, inspirational trees so we decided we wanted to include not just the champions which are the biggest but historic trees, community trees, some unique trees, um, even noteworthy species becomes, because some species are more interesting. Uh, it, it, instead of having a one specimen tree, they're interesting because in repetition, they're gorgeous, things like dogwoods and redbuds. So um, we actually have 10 categories and tried to find about 100 trees that were the best representatives of those categories. And, and Jeff, of course, uh, these, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the trees that were nominated for this process, weren't, wasn't it? Oh yes, we, we set up a website and invited the public to nominate trees in, in their own words and their own pictures. And we received about a thousand nominations there. And we got, probably had at least as many big trees that were nominated over the time period. So I, I would guess we had well over 2,000 trees that were nominated to us. I want to get. I want to show off some of the pictures in the books. I want to go through some of the categories. We may not get to them all. Um, I want to start out with old trees because there's an example of trees that are not necessarily spectacular, but they're obviously old. And an example are the red cedars up in Giles County. Jeff, talk about those. Well, the, those trees are remarkable because they're also very small. And it, it makes a good point, which uh, Nancy did a wonderful job of describing in the text, that large trees are not necessarily big, and big trees are not necessarily old. And you, you, can't, you can't really judge a tree's age by its size. Those red cedars in the book, I believe, are only about six inches in diameter, and yet they're believed to be around 500 years old, based on some tree ring work that were done on trees in the same area uh, growing on these cliffs. It's just a harsh environment, so the tree makes very little growth from year to year, but that also makes it e easy to support itself over a long period of time. Mm. I know uh, uh, bald cypresses in Southampton County are generally old, and bald cypresses in general are, are, there's some really fascinating pictures in the book about bald cypresses. Can you talk about those? Nancy? Oh gosh, yes. Well, the oldest trees in Virginia that have been dated are bald cypresses on the Blackwater River. They um, were dated by a geoscientist from the University of Arkansas, and we know there are trees in the Blackwater Swamp that are 833 years old, and Dr. Staley suspects that there are probably 1,000-year-old trees in that swamp. Um, and then on the Nottaway, which has been called, um, parts of the Nottaway have been called the Lost Forest because it was within the last five years that some incredibly interesting trees and the largest what what 
was, and as we feature in our book, is the largest tree in the state, a bald cypress is in the, uh, on the Nottaway. Just strange um, trees shaped like teepees and trees shaped like tea kettles and trees shaped like lobsters. Um, <laughs> there are lots of, uh, not in addition to bald cypresses, there are lots of um, water tupelos in there that have really interesting shapes. Mm -hmm. So, And some of those trees may indeed be older, but they're, they're hollow on the inside, so yeah. we'll never know for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to, to paraphrase you, you, old trees are not necessarily historic, and historic trees are not necessarily old. And there's mm -hmm. some interesting historic trees, and two I want to mention specifically. Um, one is the Emancipation Oak in Hampton. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, that drew my attention because I was the one that received the nominations as they came in on the web and through the mail. And that was the uh, single most nominated tree in Virginia. More people nominated that independent of each other than any other tree. So that really struck me uh, right away. It's on the campus of Hampton University. And when you go to Hampton University to look for this tree, it doesn't matter who you stop and ask, they all know the tree. And that's not often the case when you go <laughs> hunting for trees. So we were impressed not by just the number of nominations, but by the sheer love, shared love of, uh, of this tree with everybody on campus. The tree is historically significant because it's the, the site of the first Southern reading, first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation in the South. And Nancy's done some wonderful bit of uh, digging into this tree, and the, and the history is is really very fascinating. It, it uh, there are lots of exceptions to the Emancipation Proclamation that most people don't realize, and uh, uh, it was read in the South, but it was on Union-controlled land, I believe. <laughs> and <laughs> if you want the details, ask Nancy. But it's a, it's a great tree, great historic significance. Well, Nancy, I want to ask the and then more of a broader question in terms of trees becoming part of the community and there's a separate chapter on community trees but this is a this is an example of how a tree defines a place and that happens a lot in Virginia and in this book doesn't it? It does. Um, if you just think of tree there's some trees that, that are just familiar visual features of the community. Everybody says you know turn left at the walnut uh, on the corner that kind of thing. Um, I'm, remembering one nomination we got that I loved. It said a whole uh, 15 cousins have been fighting to save <laughs> this tree. <laughs> you probably remember which tree that was. I can't remember. It's a black walnut yeah, here in Montgomery walnut. County. It was wonderful. A mile 15, of cousins. A mile, a mile of, cousins of cousins have been <laughs> fighting to save that tree. That's right. <laughs> but um, there's some trees that the community just relates to. Um, two of the community trees that I really like in our book, I mean, I like them all, but two that I um, particularly appreciated. Um, one is the tricycle tree in Ashland, which <laughs> happens to be my hometown. It has a, um, an old, the wheel of an antique tricycle embedded in its branches almost 20 feet off the ground. And it's been there since 1908 when a, uh, Boy, some boys had a tree house in the tree and they used it, used the rim of the tricycle as a pulley to pull uh, things up to their tree house. And actually that tree has, was damaged in July of this past year and now, you know, Randolph Macon and a community of, a, a committee of community people are trying to find a way to save that part of the tree and put it in the library and maybe, you know, write a children's book about it. But mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of Ashland history tied up in that tree because the child who put the, um, the trike up there eventually became a Randolph-Macon professor and, and not to mention it's a gorgeous willow oak. So, um, Back on history, I yeah. want the other tree I specifically wanted to ask uh, you about, Jeff, was is Sally's Crying Tree in, in Marion. Uh, that's a heck of a story. Yes, and it's difficult for me to tell because it's it's a very emotional story for me and I think just about anybody who uh, comes into contact with Evelyn, Evelyn Lawrence who tells the story. And Evelyn is a retired school teacher in a small town in southwest Virginia called Marion. Uh, which was used to be called Royal Oaks, and this is one of the <laughs> one of their um, beautiful oaks that they still have in the town. But uh, Evelyn tells the story of her grandmother, Sally Adams, who was, uh, as a slave, was sold at the auction block along with the rest of her family, and the rest of the family was sold to a distant landowner. So she was left by herself in this town, and. Uh, since she had no family, she adopted the tree as her as her sole family member, and she would go to the tree at night and cry. 
and um, I particularly love this story because I think uh, every school child should know that uh, if, if they need to, there, there are trees they can adopt. Yeah. There, and there, we have lots of trees that were nominated that were trees that provided solace to people. It's an interesting connection. Well, and there are a lot of trees out there that weren't nominated that provided a lot of <laughs> right. solace too, I think. Right. Um, I wanted to talk about the idea of champion trees a little bit. Do, do we have an idea how many champion trees Virginia has total, different types of species of trees? Oh, yes. Um, it's well over 500. We, um, uh, many states and, and at the national level, they, they only recognize the uh, native and the naturalized trees, trees that have become established once they've been planted. But in Virginia, we, we try to recognize every, every species, whether it's native, uh, uh, naturalized, or uh, non-native and non-naturalized. And so we have quite a few. Um, I think we have 26 trees that are also national champs. Yes, and we're, yeah, we're fifth in the country. Uh -huh. we, we, uh, there, there are four states that have more national champions than us, so we're, we're quite proud of that. And I think some people have a misconception about champion trees. Well, it's the tallest, and that's not necessarily the case. And, and again, as we, we talked about before, champion trees are not necessarily huge trees, depending on the species. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of variety in those, in those champions that Virginia mm -hmm. has, I would imagine. Yes, and one of the problems that we have, quite frankly, is uh, some of the smaller stature trees uh, can be state and national champions, and they can be sitting out on the landscape, and people overlook them, and uh, and sometimes they get cut down because uh, nobody knows that they're right. that they're well, really significant trees. For example, the the state champion serviceberry is a small tree genetically small, so even the biggest one is not a huge tree, but it's the biggest for its species. And that, and that one is in the book, and it's yeah. also a national champion, so it's, 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 it's the biggest, in the, biggest well, in the country. And, and that gets to another category that you talk about, noteworthy species, in terms of trees that aren't necessarily the biggest or the uh, even the brightest, but uh, just this ones that define an area, and, and uh, red buds uh, come to mind, and you, you right. want to talk well, about we, that. Right, well, we looked all over for our original vision, you know, did have featuring only individual trees in these categories. But then we started thinking about red buds and dogwoods that are really more beautiful in repetition than they are as individual species, as individual specimens. So we decided we'd look for just a wonderful area that showcased red bud or dogwood. And um, we chose Dogwood Lane at the State Arboretum in uh, Blandy. Uh, and then we, um, red buds, Honestly, we looked all over for the be bless best place to photograph red buds. One of the best places is along I-81, and Bob actually considered trying to get out of the car and <laughs> getting those wonderful cliffs along I-81, the road cuts, which are full of blooming red buds in uh, late March, early April. Um, but the ones we featured some in Albemarle County that are on a beautiful country road, the way they usually are sort of along the edge of a woodland, those wonderful uh, pink to purple flowers. And so that's what we did with redbud and dogwood. Well, and, you, and you mentioned uh, the, along the cuts and, and this, this combination of this beautiful color of the redbuds contrasting against the limestone, the grayish limestone, especially on a wet day. I mean, that's, that's what always attracts me to the, those views. It's wonderful. Uh, but uh, I know there's one chapter, uh, you know, you try to give kind of all the trees every, every credit you can, but there's a chapter on oaks because oaks are such a part of our lives. Uh, and I do want to, since we're uh, videotaping this in Blacksburg, want to mention the oak in Blacksburg. Uh, Jeff, can you talk about that one? Well, um, did we put that in the Mighty Oaks or the community tree? That's in it, the Mighty Oaks. Okay, because yeah. it, it could have fit in so many different categories, and that's one of the reasons why we included it, because it was so versatile, mm -hmm. and uh, we could have placed it in any one of three or four right, different chapters. Right, right. And uh, I wish I could remember all the details, like the name of the street and, and the uh, the name of the lady who lives Aiken there. Aiken and Preston. Okay, that's Aiken and right. Preston. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. McCann, thank Mrs. you so McCann, much. McCann, that's right. I can tell you all about the tree, <laughs> but it's hard for me to remember all the, the other details. But um, I mean, that tree is large. Um, it's, I think, only the 26th largest white oak in the state, but still we have so many that are nominated that that in itself is very remarkable. But um, Mrs. McCann describes it as uh, the tree is her air conditioner. That was one thing that we liked about it. And Mrs. McCann's husband was uh, involved with the Heidi Tidies, which is the 
the band of the Corps cadets here at Virginia Tech, and they practice in front of that tree, and the mm -hmm. neighborhood has um, parties in front of the tree, mm -hmm. and it's even appeared in one of the New York newspapers in an advertisement, which we didn't know until we actually uh, interviewed Mrs. McCann for the, for the book, and uh, what else can I say? It's, it's just a one beautiful of, tree. Yeah. And, the, and yeah. the photo is one of the Heidi tidies in front of the tree. Right. And, Ra rather and dwarfed by the tree, I might That's say. right. And last night there were there were five tuba players uh, in front of the tree mm. uh, as they were practicing. That's that's a little hard. We it's hard to big trees just don't show up in photographs. You often have to put something in there to provide scale. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you put a person in it, the human eye tends to go to the person instead of the tree. So that was sort of a tension in this whole process. What can you put in there to provide scale that doesn't upstage the trees? So. Well, and, and then when there's a photo of a cat with the tree. Right. I, we I, had I, to, I, had to I give, really like that one. Well, I had to entice him over with part of Bob's turkey sandwich to get him <laughs> over there. <laughs> but yeah, the cat was good. <laughs> Somebody said that's either a huge tree are very small cats. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, one of the chapters and uh, it talks about tree places, and you know, obviously there's national forests and, and parks and that sort of thing, but uh, uh, cemeteries. And uh, the photo in the book where there's the tombstone basically now surrounded right. by That's the in tree. Right, mm -hmm. uh, But I think, uh, to me, places like Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond and, and other cemeteries where the trees have been there have been preserved before the cemeteries were even started and just provide the, I don't know, provide the historical background for, for, for where, why the cemeteries are there, I guess. What other places do you think about when you think about tree places? Well, the, the whole issue is where do we have places that trees can be unmolested for five or six hundred years, you know, in, in the, where a slow growing tree can reach maturity. And cemeteries are one. I mean, we really do. And cemeteries are wonderful because Hollywood Cemetery, for example, is open every day of the year, dawn to dusk, free. You know, it's so easy to go in there and see them. College campuses are another wonderful place to see trees. Um, the Tech Campus is wonderful. William & Mary, University of Mary Washington, wonderful trees at Sweetbriar. Um, college campuses, particularly if they have an arborist and a good horticulture program, um, can be wonderful for trees. And then we talk about state and national forests, um, some natural areas like Caledon in King, King George, George County, County. County. George, right on the Potomac River. Uh, um, that was one that I just happened to read about in a Native Plant Society newsletter, and I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. And it's a mature beech forest that is just gorgeous. And again, it's anybody can go there, visit any day of the year, open dawn to dusk, free, and here's this beautiful mature beech forest on the Potomac. So. And we were talking before we started taping, I wanted to ask, ask each of you your favorite trees and beaches are among your favorites. Beaches? Uh, I in my top three. <laughs> <laughs> They're just so beautiful. Um, that's a tree that we featured in Noteworthy Species, I believe, because there was just so much to say about the beach. Um, and I don't know, there's a gorgeous one in Falls Church, and that's the one, one, we, one of the ones we featured mm -hmm. in front of a church. And down at the bottom of the hill, thousands of cars drive by there every day, but very few people know that tree's at the top of the hill. So. Yeah. And Jeff, for you, uh, hickories, I guess, are at the top of your list. Well, right now, um, <laughs> in, listening, in, in listening to Nancy talk, you know, my, my uh, Ph.D. dissertation was on beech trees, and so obviously I've uh, been very interested in, in them in the past. But uh, right now I am uh, very much interested in trees that I think were part of uh, a, an American Indian horticulture. Um, particularly those here in the southeast, and so hickory is is one of them. Hickory is actually an Algonquian word mm -hmm. because the Europeans did not have a name for it when they arrived here. It was a very important food source. The uh, the nuts uh, were smashed, and then uh, together with the nut meats, they were boiled, and the nut meats would rise to the top, and so with the oils and a very nutritious food was made out of it called hikora, and so uh, a poor hikor poor hikorora or something to that effect, and the. Uh, and the name of the tree lasts to this day. And then the other thing about hickory, which is so um, important for me, is is that very few people um, call attention to it. I literally had to get on the phone and ask people to nominate hickories. Right. So when you go and see the few hickories that were nominated to our uh, project, 
most of those were at my urging. <laughs> well, the one I specifically want to mention is the shag bark hickory, because I think the picture in the book really tells the story about what shag bark hickories are, this, this appearance of this bark that looks like it's going to fall off, and yet that's the way the tree functions. Mm -hmm. And it's a spectacular example in, in down in southwest Virginia, far southwest Virginia, mm -hmm. I believe. Right. Yes, there, there are also some wonderful shag bark hickories at uh, Oatlands in Leesburg, mm -hmm. but they have to get old for that bark to begin to peel off in long strips and curl up, but it's, it's quite a quite a hairdo. <laughs> this has been uh, obviously a long process to get this book uh, published, University of Virginia Press. Uh, and again, I, I want to give credit to Robert Llewellyn as much as I can for the outstanding photographs. But now that the book is finished, what do you hope comes out of this? And Jeff, let me start with you. I know uh, uh, this sort of arose from working with kids in the 4-H program, and, and I would guess that'd be part of the legacy of the book that you'd like to see. Right. Well, there were two overarching goals. One was to document these trees in the first place. Let's find out where they are and, um, and what stories they tell. But the second overarching goal was to engage a new generation in the care and appreciation of trees. And so I, I, in many ways I feel like the work is really just beginning for me because I, I want to talk about these trees with school children and 4-H uh, clubs and youth groups wherever I can reach them. And, and Nancy, same question to you. I know uh, uh, you said uh, in a recent presentation that uh, one, one point you want to get across is trees are good. But it goes much beyond that, doesn't it? Right. I, I think lots of times we think of trees as the background against which you know human activity takes place. And we want to move them to the foreground and make people think of trees not just as ornaments or as background material, but as real workhorses in terms of what they do for the environment. And to pay attention to individual trees. Um, another thing that I'm particularly um, eager to do is to try to encourage people where they can to plant long-lived, often slow-growing legacy trees as opposed to faster-growing ornamentals because if we're going to have these kinds of trees coming along for future generations, somebody's got to protect those spots and plant those trees with the genetic potential to live a long time. That sounds like a good place to start by looking <laughs> or stop by looking towards the future. Our guests have been uh, Jeff Kerwin, forestry professor and extension specialist at Virginia Tech, and Nancy Ross Hugo, outdoor writer and co-author of Remarkable Trees of Virginia, photographed by Robert Llewellyn, University of Virginia Press. Thank you both for joining us for this discussion, and I want to thank our audience for joining us. Have a good day.